Hey everybody, I am back with uh, another game from the Slav Exchange. This one I played in my last Over the Board tournament, and uh, I wanted to pick up that theme that I did in the last video, talking about uh, uh, realizing advantage and not trading off into a simple end game just because you're up a single pawn and how that works. And also, uh, I found some cool tactics in this game that I wanted to review that I think will be useful and likely to show up in your games. Uh, so in this game, we have a Slav exchange, and uh, we played the bishop g5, the knight went to f6, and we captured, and we have this sort of broken pawn structure for black. And uh, this d5 pawn is going to be the big target here. And uh, here, uh, black played bishop to e7, which kind of actually breaks the course, or doesn't break the course, sorry, it breaks the, uh, the, the repertoire. Uh, this move is not covered in this move order, but uh, bishop e7 is covered in a different line, which we're going to talk about that. Uh, so in this game, I played e3, and he went bishop e6, and I went bishop to d3. Uh, just doing standard development, but this kind of misses the opportunity to transpose into the proper line. And so, which gets us to an idea of not just developing routely, um, but having some ideas of what we're going for and understanding what this bishop e7 move does differently from the more standard uh, approach, which is knight c6 and then bishop e6, and then later bishop d6, uh, covering the pawn that way. So with the bishop on d6, it's hitting the f4 square. And so if we compare to the, the main course line, which goes knight c6, e3, and then bishop e7, uh, we go knight g2, or knight e2 immediately with the idea that we're going to go to f4 really fast, which is what happens when this bishop is setting on uh, e7 instead of d6, because if the bishop's on d6, we can't so easily play knight f4. Uh, and so it goes bishop e3, a3, queen d7, and then we go g3. And the idea is we're lining up all of our pressure against this pawn, and we maybe can play queen to b3, adding up even more pressure against this pawn. So after bishop e6, when I just went e3 and bishop d3, um, we kind of missed the mark a little bit. It was uh, much stronger to do the immediate bishop, or sorry, knight to g2, and then say we went knight c6, knight f4. Uh, he's almost forced to move the this bishop again. Uh, it's tough to defend this pawn. Uh, so bishop to b4, and already black has lost the tempo. They can no longer play bishop to d6 and threaten our knight. And I looked at, so now looked at rook c1, and bishop d3, or sorry, after castles, bishop d3 here works nicely. Um, it's not necessarily going to work now to go g3 and bishop g2 because he has this option of chopping this knight. Uh, so we're going to go back to sort of a standard development. Looked at queen to d7. The idea is just to bring the rooks to the middle and try to have a solid position. Uh, but after castling, we already have some pretty nice tactical ideas, uh, which is going to be a theme that's going to show up and not just this sideline, but in the game itself. Uh, so if black just continues with a standard developing move, um, we have a big threat, or we have a big tactical blow already. We're already much, much, much better, already winning, because we can just play knight takes uh, d5, knight c takes d5. Now later, we're gonna look at uh, capturing this way in a different line, it's very, very similar. And the difference is that this bishop is not on e7, which is gonna be important in just a minute. We'll look at this, uh, because we have uh, takes, and now we hit this move, queen to h5, threatening mate, and attacking the bishop to pick it back up. And here, black can play, he can play g6, and we're just going to go grab the bishop, or he can try the more challenging move, which is to defend the bishop and escape out this way, which is why it's important that the bishop is not on e7 here. It gives us additional resource of the rook going to d8. But we're still totally crushing here, because we have queen takes f7, king f8, and we have a tempting check here, which is not going to do anything, because he can run out. Uh, sorry, not there, but to here, perhaps. Uh... And so here we go a3, and we would like this bishop to run away. Um, he really can't, if he goes to, to d2, we'll just play the rook up, and then he's got to do something else anyway. And uh, he can't obviously come here. He can't go to e7. So he's got two options, a5 and d6. We'll look at d6 first, because it just allows a, a nice little mate that happens real quick. Um, sorry, click the wrong button there. Bishop d6, and uh, we have queen check forcing this out, and then now we can take with check, forcing the king forward. We can come back with check. Notice he can't go backwards, so he's got to give up. And if your queen's set on d5, 
And I have a queen, a bishop, a knight, and a rook active, and some pawns in the center. That's not where the black king wants to be. He can take the knight, and we just give a check. And when he comes here, we have queen f3 mate. So that's obviously not possible. Aside from the fact that it was probably okay if we maybe just took the bishop. That could probably work too. Uh, so for that reason, uh, black needs to go not to d6, but to a5. And the whole point of why we kick this bishop away from here was we want to lift the rook. We're going to lift the rook, and now we're again threatening to take the bishop. Uh, black really has nothing better than just to capture the pawn and give us the piece back. When we have uh, gained our material back, uh, we're up a pawn, and we still have quite a strong attack. Uh, because if he drops back to bishop e6, we just have d5, and everything continues. We get our piece back, and uh, we're attacking like a madman. Uh, he can maybe play queen to d6, but no problem. We'll just take the rook, and then we'll take either the knight or the bishop, and we have quite quite some material here with uh, attack to boot. Uh, so that was just the first version of this tactical sequence we're going to look at. We're going to look at another version that cropped up in the game. So I played bishop to d3, and here just castles, and now I went knight ge2, just going on for standard development. Not needing, it would have been, again, Better to, to lead with the knight to see what happens and try to get quick, quick pressure. So try to remember that. When the bishop's on e7, we want to quickly bring the knight to f4. Play knight c6, and then I played rook to c1, which is, again, another sort of lazy developing move. I don't really need rook to c1. The idea of why I want to play rook to c1 is I don't want knight b4, and then I have to drop the bishop back, and I've shut my rook in. But that's really not such a big deal. Uh, he can drop back to b1 later we're going to play a3 the knight's got to move back and then we can transfer our bishop to a2 and we have additional pressure and white spent two moves uh moving the knight back and forth and a3 is a move we want sometimes anyway to stop this bishop b4 because we don't want to trade these two pieces uh because that's the only way that this bishop can help participate in the defense of d5 is to trade itself for one of our knights uh so rook c1 uh, again, a bit of a slow move. Better would have been knight f4 immediately. So, for example, knight f4, and we already have a familiar tactic that we should have just looked at. Uh, this time, uh, if he plays queen to d7, uh, we have f takes this time, not c takes, because that allows, um, after the capture, allows a check. And, well, we'll just look at it. So if we play c takes, he can take once, we can't take twice. We try our little check here, but he has this in between. He goes here, he comes to the side, and then now he plays f5. And the point is, is that we can't capture here threatening mate and the queen, which is what we can do in some lines, uh, because it's an in between move. He gives a second check, and uh, he's going to be able to play g6. We can take the queen, he'll take our queen, and we're just down a piece. Uh, so in this variation, uh, we need to take with the f knight first. That way, there is no check here. And after caps, we get bishop eight, or sorry, queen h5. And then now g6 is forced because this rook f8 idea doesn't work anymore because the bishop's on e7, and we'll just go check mate. So g5, we play queen takes, and we've got a clean pawn, uh, a healthy center, and uh, we're well on our way to having a fantastic position. Uh, so in the game, I play rook c1. He played a6, and I played castles, and rook c8, and then I played knight to f4. He played queen d7, and I played a3, and then immediately wanted to like smack myself, because I just missed the golden opportunity to execute the tactic that I just showed you guys. And I saw this almost immediately after I played a3, and I was feeling pretty frustrated with myself, because I missed a really great opportunity to... Uh, just win a clean pawn for, for, for nothing and to get rid of his bishop pair in the process, have a nice passer, would have had a fantastic position. Uh, I still kind of am threatening that, so he's got to do something about it, and he chose to play g5, which is not a, not a great move uh, because it allows him to play queen h5, and uh, he chose to play bishop f5. I expected, and it's better to play f5, but against f5, well, we still have this really strong pressure here against the h7 square, and we can just continue g4. And our point is that this bishop is really low on squares, and so you can take our knight if you want, and we're going to grab back. 
And we have a big threat of capturing here, hitting the queen, and threatening mate at the same time. Huge problems. Uh, if you move the queen out of the way, uh, we can actually just play f6 and ask you to figure out how you're going to stop mate because you can't. Uh, so this would have been uh, the this would have been the my reply had he played uh, f5. Uh, instead, he played bishop to f5, and so I just captured. He takes, and I played here, and so he played rook to f8, and I went f4 because I I saw that. You know, I have these knights, I want to open this rook up, my queen's here, his king is looking pretty airy, and I, I really think this was a really strong way to continue. He played king to g7, and here, I, I, I don't know why I didn't just open up. I started getting kind of clever, and I, I thought, okay, I'm going to hold this tension and play rook to f3. And I, I figured that he was going to drop back, and I thought, okay, fine, I'll just trade queens. That's the mistake. That's the I, the mentality that causes me problems here is that I was willing to just trade down and try to win a much better position. I mean, we are totally crushingly better even after the queen trade, but it's so much easier if we leave the queens on. So something like this, like just capturing so much stronger. And after takes, I mean, we can even just drop the queen back and then lift the rooks with all kinds of problems. We have lots of options here. Uh, queen h3 is a nice move, and if he insists on a queen trade, we can actually do it now, because we're going to win additional pawn. We can grab here, he takes, and then we grab the queen, and we capture here. And we are up two pawns now, and probably going to be up a few more pawns. This is a dramatically more simplified position than what I chose to go into during the game. We've already won additional material. It's a lot easier to make our pass pawn go up the board. Like king g7, I looked at uh, rook cf1. Yes, we give one pawn back, but we're going to capture this guy. We're going to capture this guy. We can probably play d5 or maybe even bring our knight up. And we, we're attacking. We have more threats. And we have a pass pawn still. And we're doing fantastic. So this would have been a much stronger way to continue, even if I wanted to trade queens. Uh, but again, I didn't, I didn't have to. After it takes here, uh, going back to, to e2, or, or even d1 with the idea of coming back to d3 or lifting the rooks across, supporting this knight coming in, all much, much stronger ideas. Instead, I played rook to f3, uh, allowing, or not allowing, basically forcing uh, him to come back. And now I really don't have anything better than to trade queens. Uh, I could try to drop back, but then that allows here. I could try to play here, which I kind of did think about, but that's going to end up perhaps being quite bad because of f5, uh, maybe. Not f5. f5 is not a problem. But yeah, if I come here, yeah, I mean, f5, and I, I can't take, so I have to drop back, and he's going to play g4, and he closes things down. My rook comes out, and I, I, the king side is shut down quite a bit. I have a backwards pawn. This is not so great. Uh, so I captured, and he played king takes. And again, we're doing great. We're still in a really strong position. Um, I went and captured because I wanted to open the F file and attack. This was my idea. I thought I was going to get great pressure. And I am. I just didn't quite find the right way to do it, which it's easier to do when you still have the queen on the board against this exposed king to make threats. He captured. I played rook cf1. He went back. And I went ahead and captured here. Again, why? This knight is dominant. I just thought, I'm going to trade down. This is going to be simple. I have all kinds of pressure. I didn't want him to be able to bring the pawn up to defend this pawn. And I had some ideas of trying to, you know, I had this idea that I wanted to put a rook on f6, bring this knight across. Then I thought I was going to be able to win this pawn, which is kind of silly. He just plays h6. Um, but so more trades. Oh, I, why trade? I, I, I have more. My pieces are better. My knight's better than his bishop was. And I, my knight was making all kinds of threats, controlling all kinds of squares. And this is just simplifying down for the sake of just trying to go into a simpler endgame. When I'm only up one pawn is silly. I'm still better. I'm still quite a bit better, still winning. Uh, but it's move by move getting a bit tougher. Uh, instead of capturing, just this idea g4, fixing this pawn. And then after h6, I put, wanted to bring this knight in. It was is a great, just improving both knights. These knights are monsters. He could bring the rook across to try to attack, and I'm going to play rook f5. And these 
these rooks are fantastic. Say he plays rook d7. I mean, what else is he going to do? Well, now I just I can play here, push him back, and I'm ready to just advance the pawn. Look at all these squares that I'm controlling along the route of this pawn. Uh, he can knight to b8. What else is he going to do? And then d6. And look, I just want a piece. I already want a piece already. It's it's that easy. Just bring your pieces to the center and, and then shove your pawn. It, it was so simple. Uh, instead, I would trade it, thinking I was trading into a simplifying endgame. He went here. I played rook f6, king g7. I played d5. I thought I'd get my pawns up the board a little bit. He brought the knight over this way, and I played e4, h6. I didn't want to move this knight because I was like, ha this knight's blocking his rook. It's so clever. I'm playing restrictive chess. And I went rook to b6. And he went here, and I brought this rook. And I was like, ha he's totally clamped down. He can't move anything. Uh, this, this knight is stuck defending this guy. This knight's in the way. Uh, otherwise I'm going to take this guy. And I was just going to bring my king up the board and advance the pawns, which is what I proceeded to do. He played rook e7. What else is he going to do? Played king up, rook d7. Uh, but one thing I wanted to note about these rooks is they're holding him back, but they can't really move either. It's not like I can play rook b3 and then try to swing the other rooks over to attack here because uh, that would hang this rook. And this this rook's not so stable. I played king to e3, and he, he, he made a really nice move. Knight to e5. And I, it, I, I, he's threatening a fork here. Uh, he's threatening a fork here. And I didn't like king to d4 because I thought knight c6, and he's going to win the exchange. I, I mean, I, can, I, I don't have anything better than to just take. And after he takes, I take here. And actually, this would have been perfectly fine. My king is super active. I've got one pass pawn. My knight's great. Uh, I can make a second pass pawn. And this is totally a viable way to play. And this would have been much, much, much stronger. Instead, uh, after calculating all of the lines of moving the king forward, I was like, ah, screw it. I'm just going to go back and I'll figure out a new route. And I played king to f2 and immediately shuddered like this, like my whole body shook because I saw I had just thrown the game away. Knight g4 and I just hang a whole rook, not, not even exchange, just an absolute whole rook. And uh, by this point in the game, this was a g40 event and... Uh, I had like six minutes, and uh, he was down to two minutes, 20 seconds. And I sat there at the board with my eyes closed, just taking some deep breaths, um, just intending to resign, because that's what you should do. Uh, but um, So I just sat there with my eyes closed for like four minutes. I had about two minutes on the clock, and I decided, you know what? I'm just going to play on, see what happens. And, you know, I played king a3, he took, eventually I brought my king across. And in the time scramble... Believe it or not, I managed to hold the draw somehow. I got down. I was down to a bear king versus a knight and a pawn, <laughs> and maybe it was it was a weird knight and pawn situation where the pawn was here, his knight was here, his king was over here, and uh, I had my knight. My my king was sitting on this square, and he was defending the pawn from the wrong direction. And I didn't check with table bases, but I think that because he was defending a from, I actually had a draw in position. Uh, but with like three or four seconds left, he offered me a draw and I gladly accepted. Uh, so I really just threw this game away because I simplified and thought that I was just going to win an easy, meticulous game, which is something I like to do. And that's really not the way to do this. Uh, it's better to keep more pieces on the board when you're attacking. And again, here, taking opening lines, keeping the queens on the board. And, you know, maybe after he captured here and I dropped back, maybe he's afraid to, to after, I mean, I have some serious threats here and there's lots of chances for him to go wrong. And he, he really probably doesn't have anything better than just to try to really go for the queen trade and give me another pawn. Uh, so this is another, this is the big strategic takeaway in the way that I think about chess and the way that I play that maybe isn't necessarily related to this exact position, but this kind of position that crops up for me. And then the other thing that I want you guys to take away from this game uh, is uh, some of these nice tactics after um, we bring, after we get positions like this, uh, with this idea of capturing here with the queen coming out to h5. Uh, I, it, 
this is a super comfortable, normal setup for us. And Black is playing in what looks like a completely normal way. And we have some great options just to blow him off the board with this nice tactical sequence. Uh, so anyhow, I hope that this was uh, interesting for you guys and that you enjoyed it. And uh, I'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.